And please be seated and turn, please, to Acts chapter 12, verse 21. Uh, last week, our, the message, the gospel, began spreading to the Gentile world. Jesus had said, get this gospel out to the uttermost parts of the world, and it's starting to happen, and the rest of the book of Acts is devoted to explaining the history of that. James, the brother of John, was murdered by Herod uh, and the unbelieving Jews. He was the first apostle to die. Something I didn't make clear last week I want to do now is there's, there's, there is James, the brother of John, and uh, so he was the one that was killed. There's James, who was the head of the church in Jerusalem. He's the James, the half-brother of Jesus that wrote the book of James. So even though some of you are saying, well, he got killed, so how come Peter says, go tell James uh, when, they, when Peter was delivered from jail? Because there's two James. Actually, there's more than two James. There's also James, another apostle who's never really mentioned after being listed by, by Jesus as one of the apostles, James the less. And some people think that maybe the church was run by him, but, but majority opinion, it was James, the half-brother of Jesus, that was in charge of the church in Jerusalem. And, uh, and then we saw that Peter was miraculously delivered from jail. And this week we're going to see Paul. Paul and Barnabas, apparently, the chronology seems to be that Paul and Barnabas were told by a prophet in Antioch of Syria that a famine is coming to the world, and especially to the Jerusalem area. And so they took funds, maybe some food, probably just funds, uh, to the Christian church in Jerusalem. So they went on a mission to do that. And at about the same time is when Herod is killing James. Herod is trying to have the occasion to kill Peter, but God miraculously delivers Peter, you know, breaks him out of jail. And so then it says that when Paul and Barnabas got done meeting with the leadership at the church in Jerusalem about how they're having a great time with the Gentiles, and after James was killed and Peter was killed, they, they go back to Antioch. And it says that Peter went somewhere. Peter, when he got broke out of jail, he went to the home of some disciples and he said, hey, they let me out of jail. The people are, are shocked. You know, the disciples are shocked that God miraculously bust him out of jail. And then the Bible says that then he went somewhere else, I, I think, and we're going to be dealing with this in the study, that somewhere else was Antioch. He, he might have even traveled with Paul and Barnabas to get to Antioch. He would have wanted to get away from Herod, uh, who would have been hunting him, except that Herod didn't hunt very long because he gets killed because he thinks he's, he takes the accolades of being called a god. And that's our lead-in. This is how we ended last week, is that the same Herod Agrippa I who killed James and wanted to kill Peter went to Caesarea on the Mediterranean coast on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. You know, they were just worshiping a man as God. Who's going to be demanding that in the future? The, the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to demand everybody on the face of the planet to receive his name in their hand or their forehead and bow to an image of him uh, which people have speculated for a long time, how can everybody on the world see an image of him? And now we have holographic stuff, we have all these things, and you can sit there and, you know, you are, you're FaceTiming with the Antichrist, I want you to bow to you know, I mean, you know, an image of the beast that can talk. It, can non-alive things talk in our world today? Holographic images. How many of you have seen the whale that just comes out of a basketball floor and freaks everybody in the audience? It's not even real, but they holographically put it in there and they can see these things that aren't real. We're living in a, a completely crazy, what is the truth? What's real anymore? And so this image is going to be able to speak. Well, God deals with him right away for doing that. He's going to deal with the Antichrist after he gets to do three and a half years of claiming to be God. And God lets him do it for three and a half years because he sifts. The survivors of the, you know, the people that have gotten to the last three and a half years, which is only half of the world's population, at, uh, you know, counting now, half die before the last three and a half years. And so the survivors are going to be sifted. What's more important, bowing to the Antichrist so you can buy or sell, 
or realizing that the creator is the one that you should worship. And, and that's what everybody is, that's what we're telling everybody today. What's so important in your life? Well, you know, I got this girlfriend and, uh, you know, God would say I'd have to marry her. I'm not going to do that. And so, yeah, don't tell me about your Jesus. I got things to do or vice versa. You know, whatever else is going on, people have all these things and they're, they're sacrificing eternity for temporary lies and deceptions. And terrible situation. Well, this guy thought nothing of these people worshiping him as God or saying he's God. And then immediately, verse 23 of Acts 12, then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of the Lord, the word of God, grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem back to Antioch of Syria, northern Syria today. When they had fulfilled their ministry, which was bringing financial aid to the church in Jerusalem from the Gentile church in Antioch, Syria area. And they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark, John Mark, and uh, returned. And so they returned to, to Antioch. So Acts chapter 13, verse 1. You know, that's where we, we just got done with what we ended with last week. Now in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers they, they were prophets and teachers are gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is New Testament. This is Jesus saying to the disciples, go to Jerusalem and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit to come upon you that you can be gifted for ministry. And one of those gifts is prophet, another one's teachers, pastors, teachers. And it was something that God has given to the church to this day for people to be available and desiring the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He can just say, you know what? I need another teacher. Uh, you know, I was talking to somebody about the debate about prophets. You know, just even proclaiming the Word of God today, if I'm doing it accurately, it's the power of the Holy Spirit to help me accurately do this. This is a prophecy, but he and I were talking about like future prophets like Daniel and Jeremiah. Th those aren't around, and people that say that they are, just ask them and say, oh, so you're one of those prophets, and we're going to go back to Old Testament prophet requirements, and that is you give me a stone, and if it doesn't come true, I'm going to put one right in your head just like David did with Daniel, and that, you know, because they're supposed to be stone. Well, maybe I'm not so sure. Okay, well, then maybe you're not a prophet. I've had people who say, I'm a prophet, and you know, tell me stuff that was total garbage. So, um, but, but the prophesying God, Paul wanted people to desire prophecy. He wants us to proclaim the truth of God's word. And if God does give somebody the gift of prophecy, it's worth, you know, to say, hey, something's going to happen. Um, then we say, okay, you can consider maybe that was Jesus that gave him that, that gift. But if it doesn't come true, then check them off of your potential prophet list because it's, it's not, they're not gifted. They're just thinking they are. And certain, and, and certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, which simply means black. They don't know anything more about him. Lucius of Cyrene, which is, Cyrene was in Africa. This man is also apparently mentioned in 1621, unless the one in 1621 is a, is a different uh, Lucius of Cyrene. And Maniam, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So this Herod is not the one that killed James, the apostle James, uh, the brother of John. He was the Herod that mocked Jesus in the trial of Jesus. So this, this man that is now a devoted servant of Jesus and gifted by the power of the Holy Spirit in Antioch and contributing to the church as a, as a prophet and a teacher was raised. And it doesn't mean like he was a servant of Herod the Tetrarch. He was like taking care of the word there has taken care of educated. He was raised in the home of Herod who took part in, partially took part in the killing of Jesus. And so, once again, people can be affiliated in all kinds of satanic... <laughs> I, I talk to people, especially in the jail ministry, they're serving Satan, they're serving the world, they're doing all these other things, but can Jesus save them? Yeah, absolutely. And when he does, they change, and all of a sudden their life is radically changed because Jesus takes over their life. And he was apparently um, radically changed. And... Verse 2 of chapter 13, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul 
for the work to which I have called them. Then, they, then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So they ministered to Jesus. This is something that God wants us to do. We're horrible at it in our culture, at least I am at times. And that is fasting and praying. You know, and, and when you and I were talking about this this morning, you know, what's, what's the part about fasting? Well, when you fast, you're not eating. You know, your body says, you're hungry, eat. You know, okay, eat. When you're not e- eating, you go, oh, I'm hungry, don't eat. Why? Because I want to really, I want to think about God. I want to think about, I'm doing this because I want to just think about what the Lord wants to do in my life. And the longer you go, the more you're really going to be thinking about what the Lord wants to do in your life. And, and that's the benefit of fasting. And it goes to the Old Testament, too, and praying. And just taking that time, get rid, getting rid of the busyness and everything. And, and the Lord can speak to you. He can speak to you about what you should be doing, what you should be studying, and how you can be available for the powers of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. So they're going, Lord, okay, here we are. We're back in Antioch. They're killing people over in Jerusalem. And now what, what do you want us to do? They're fasting and praying, and the Lord then, then brings a prophecy down to somebody that was available and willing and says, you know what? God just told me. I'm, we're supposed to separate you and Barnabas, and you're supposed to go to places unknown led by the Holy Spirit, and to take this gospel there. And you, God could speak to you in any number of different ways doing the same thing. So we have to be willing to get away from our business of life so that we can wait for God to give us a mission because otherwise we're too busy, too distracted, or too worldly to be available to God. And what, and what happens is we get ripped off, don't we? Because there's, not, there's no greater joy, really, and everybody here that has ever led somebody to Jesus, there, there's, there, you, there's not a drug that makes you that high. <laughs> you, you just realize that somebody just got saved. They're going to go have everlasting life. And there's nothing better than that. But if we're too busy, too, too worldly, too distracted, then we're not gonna, we might not have that. It's kind of like God has, he, he's in there, as Jesus said to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, he told his disciples that are coming back and go, why are you sitting there with that woman? Why are you talking to her? She's, she's a Samaritan. You know, what is your trip? And then Jesus then says, you know, look under the harvest. He went, there at Jacob's well, there isn't a bunch of wheat fields right there. He says, look under the harvest. He was looking at the people. You know, the harvest is ripe. It's white on the harvest, but the labors are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Hey guys, I'm gonna, pretty soon I'm going to fill you with the Holy Spirit, and you're not going. You're going to go. Oh, did you get to witness to her? Did you get to tell her about eternal life? You know, even though she's a Samaritan, you know that. See, they were still stuck on. Oh, we're Jews, and she's Samaritan. Why? Why are you talking to somebody? Because Jesus cares about the eternal soul of people, and He wants us to. And so God is basically sitting at the union office, going, "I wonder who's going to show up today," because there's lots of work to be done. You know, there's all these people that are needing to be saved. And so when you're prayer, fasting, thinking about Jesus, turning off your gaming or this or that or whatever is distracting you and say, Jesus, I want to just spend some time with you. And he goes, oh, sign up the union office and then put it on your mind. Have you talked to your, you know, long lost sister or brother or coworker or whatever have you? Why don't you just start praying for your coworker and, and just make him one of your 10 most wanted lists? That you make your own your spiritual 10 most wanted list. I, you know, you laugh. I, when I was a brand new Christian, this guy, a uh, traveling evangelist kind of guy, came and he told, that really stuck with me. And so I went, I was in the Navy um, going to welding school at the time, and, and I made a list. And one of the guys on the list, the last day, it was like, you told me you'd go to church with me. That's at the time, that's pretty much all I did, is just say, come to church. And, and he goes, yeah, but I got a sign to say, I don't care if you got a sign to say, God can heal you. I would never say that. I mean, I, why did I say that? The Holy Spirit in me was saying, you know, I was praying and he's going to go. Trophy's going to go with you. Where the trophy? Ah, I'm trying to remember the name. It wasn't Trophy. Um, he's going to, um, Folson. <laughs> Folson's going to go with you. Don't take excuse. I've got a sign to say, no, you're going to go with me. We went to Calvary, San Diego. Mike McIntosh goes out and says, and for everybody that has a sinus headache in here, I just pray the Lord would heal you. (laughs) 
And I was ushering at the time, and I'm on the left-hand side, and Trofer's sitting on, uh, not Trofer, um, Folson. <laughs> Folson was sitting on the left-hand side. And, and I looked at him, and he was just like this, and he went like this. And when we left, I said, Folson, how's your headache? And he goes, it's gone. That's all he said. And, and we, we left welding school. The reason I, I really was pushing on him is because we weren't going to see each other again, never did see each other again. I regret I never took his phone number or anything to find out what happened, but he heard the gospel that day. He got healed that day, and it was only because I had a 10 most one list that I was even thinking about Folson. So, and I would have missed that. And so we have to remember, we're missing things by just thinking about the here and now. Yeah, so every once in a while, we should want to show up at God's union office. So Acts chapter 13, verse 3, Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. On the first, this, is, this is Paul's first missionary journey. And laying of hands is just recognizing, don't go out in your own strength. It's like we're praying for the Holy Spirit to come upon you, to give you uh, the wisdom of where you're going to go, what you're going to say, what you're going to do. So Galatians 1, 7, let's turn there as a side issue. Because the gospel that Paul is going to take to the Gentile world by going to the synagogues, every place he goes on this first missionary journey, he goes into the, these various cities apart from Israel, but the Jews were spread all over the world. They're spread in Asia, Asia Minor, Macedonia. What his MO is going to be on every missionary journey is show up at a synagogue. And the synagogues are all about teaching people how to obey the law of Moses, be a good Jewish boy, get circumcised, and then maybe you'll be okay with God on Judgment Day. And what, what Paul is going to do is say, no, you can get, now there's this Jesus who was prophesied and came and he's the Messiah and he's, he's the Savior of the world and you have to just believe and trust in him as your Savior and you can have everlasting life with him. That's what he's going to be saying. Well, so what we're going to do in Galatians is we're going to see that when Paul and Barnabas went back to Antioch before they're going on their missionary journey. Um, Peter is with them at some point in Antioch. And what happens is Peter is, is being cool with the Gentiles, like sitting down with the Samaritan woman. He's, he's okay with the Gentiles until a man, you know, somebody from the church in Jerusalem, James, comes. And then he goes, oh, James is going to give me a hard time about sitting with Gentiles. And then they move, and then Paul gets into Peter, and that's what we're going to be seeing here. So he's, and, so, and just to set the stage here, Paul goes on the first missionary journey, tells the people in the Galatian churches, which means the, Turkey, the, the churches in Turkey, and he tells them, salvation in Jesus, you don't have to be circumcised, comes back to Antioch. And then he finds out that following him were some Christian Jews that said, oh, no, 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 Paul, he's really not an apostle. We're the ones that are right with God. In addition to believing in Jesus, you need to get circumcised. And then Paul finds out about that, and he writes this letter. That's, that's the, what's happening here. Um, and he talks about how, guys, I was given the gospel by Jesus himself. Um, I didn't get it from men on the contrary, when they, when he went to Jerusalem to deliver the money to the church in Jerusalem, and on the contrary, when they, James and the other leaders of the church in Jerusalem, before, before you know, at the same time James is being killed and Peter, they're trying to kill him, saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision to Gentiles had been committed to me, that God raised me up to teach Gentiles how to get right with God, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. Peter was primarily, although he talked to Gentiles too, Cornelius being one, but he primarily was building the Jewish church along with James in Jerusalem. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcision, Jews, also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. And then uh, Galatians 1.9, and when James, the half-brother of Jesus, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, Cephas, meaning Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, these are the pillars, these are the, of the church, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. 
They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. So these guys coming from James saying, you have to be circumcised. Well, James didn't even tell me that when I was telling what we were telling the Gentiles. So don't listen to these guys, because when I went to Jerusalem, I got the right hand of fellowship. I got the green light from the leadership in the church, even though God doesn't consider these leaders as anything. There's no pillars in the church. There's no popes in the church. Jesus is the head of the church, and we just care about what he said. And so then Galatians 2.11. Now when Peter, uh, who was busted from jail, had come to Antioch, in, to me in getting away from Herod, Acts 2, 12, 17, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself fearing those who were of the circumcision. He feared those who were of the circumcision. You know, oh man, you know, what are they going to say about me if I'm sitting down with Gentiles? It's kind of like if the pastor comes over while you're watching TV. Oh, well, you better turn the TV off, whatever. You know, just it, it's, it's this mindset of I'm, I'm okay with God by what I perform and do. Are we all cursed with that? It, it's, it's cur we're cursed with this mindset of working, doing certain things just right to get our salvation, to be right with salvation. It's religion. God, you know, the rest of our life, God is trying to work religion out of us because the relationship that we have with Jesus accomplishes the same thing, only it does it from the heart. I, I want to please Jesus. He's, I've got a relationship with him. God, take these things out of my life that I'm watching. Take these things out of my life that I'm doing. And God, I only care about what you have said. And the, and the New Testament, Jesus was saying, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved because that's a work. There is no work salvation. There's no Jesus plus. Jesus plus, you have to show up at least 50% of the time to church during the year. You have, to, you have to read your Bible. You have to plus, 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 plus. Does a true Christian in love with Jesus want to go to church? Yes. You don't have to make it a thing that, well, if you don't go to church, you're not saved, or you don't read your Bible, you're not saved. But a true Christian with relationship wants to go to church, wants to, get, wants to read their Bible. And so I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed, because he was fearing man. And Galatians 2.13, and the rest of the Jews who played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. So, so Paul's getting ready to go on the mission field with Barnabas, and he had to deal with this right then. You know, hey, when we're going, we're going to go with the true gospel. And so Barnabas got up and went away, and so then... Paul has to rebuke Peter to his face. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in a matter of Gentiles and not of Jews, and, and we don't know exactly what he meant by that, but there could have been other things that, that Peter wasn't doing as a good Jewish boy, but it could have just been, hey, Peter, are you perfect according to the law of Moses? No? Well, then you're living like a Gentile. Because they don't do it either. That's what Paul goes on to say in Romans. So if you, Peter, know that you're not justified by trying to do the law of Moses, you're not living like a Jew, you're living like a Gentile. So why are you, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Why are you trying to put a burden on them like they have to do what the law says to get right with God when you know there is no way to get right with God? according to the law, as he's going to go on to say. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is, and this is underlined in bold, I have it bold in your notes, is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, so many people, you know, you tell them, oh, hey, are you going to give some, are you going to get saved? Do you want to get saved? Oh, I, I got to clean up my act first. No, 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 no. You, you can't clean up your act and get right with God. You get right with God and he'll clean up your act. Uh, so we don't get justified by the works of the law. Um, but it's by faith in Jesus, which means God's salvation, Christ, the anointed one, the promised anointed one to take away the sins of the world. Even we 
uh, going on in verse 16, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. I, I love asking people the question, if you die today and, you're, and there's somebody, you know, there's a gatekeeper at the gold, pearly gates and they ask you, well, why, why should I let you in? If they say anything, well, I've been to church, I've been baptized, I'm this, I'm that. This is exactly showing they're not saved. Because by the works of law, nobody's going to be justified. Uh, our testimony at the pearly gates is because Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Because he made it so that the, his shed blood justified me as if I've never done anything wrong. And even though I have done wrong, I confessed it to God that I don't deserve to come in here. But that he made a way so that I could. <laughs> and I happen to notice something in the Bible reading front to back. God keeps his promises. So get out of the way. I'm going to go see my Jesus. You know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's something that... We should be prepared to say there's nothing, and then and be honest with people. I've been a Christian for years, you know. Oh, okay. What happens when you die? And they give some religious stuff. I'm sorry. I have to be honest with you. you. You you're not saved, and you'll be very grieved if you don't realize and confess to God you're a sinner in need of a savior. Um, back to Acts 13:3. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, a person of the Trinity, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now you have a map in your notes, and it'll also be posted on the website. So you can see the first missionary journey where they go to the island of Cyprus, an island to this day. These cities are there to this day. And when they arrived at Salamis, Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. They also had John, John Mark, as their assistant. So Barnabas and Paul are gifted by the Holy Spirit to be teachers, prophets to the people, but they brought you know, somebody to help them, John Mark, who ends up bailing on them after they get back to the mainland of Turkey. Um, and uh, he, Paul always, as I said earlier, he always went to the synagogues. Why would he do that? And it really applies to what we do today, too. Is If somebody's in the synagogue, they're Jews. And if they're Jews, they go to the synagogue, they listen to the law of God. They listen to the history of the Jews. So they know the history of the Jewish people and God's interaction with them. They know what it is to be the promised people. And they know the word of God. They have a fear of God because they're going to the synagogue. And the other people we're going to find out that are there are Gentiles who want to be Jews. They're Gentiles who say, you know what? I don't think worshiping idols is the way to go as the Romans and the Greeks and everybody else does. We're, we're not going to worship idols anymore. We want to go to the synagogue and find out from them their history and how to worship their God. And the, and the leaders of the synagogue would say, okay, you know, first thing guys got to do, you got to get circumcised. And then we go to Jerusalem three times a year and we do the feast. And you, you do this, 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 we'll call you a Jew. And then you can be added to the Jewish nation and you're a good boy or woman. And, that, and so you go to God-fearing people. And, and what we want to do is go to people that really realize they're in trouble and they need to get right with God. And, and they're all over the place. And they can look like right now they're not uh, God-fearing, but if you can just talk to them and just say, you know, I know I messed up, you, that's what you want to do. And the more they know about the Bible, the easier it is to communicate to them the truth of the gospel. Now, when they had gone, Acts 13, 6, and when they had gone through the island of Paphos, the island to Paphos, <laughs> to the city of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, um, druggy, demonic power magician guy, a false prophet serving the devil and deceiving the people, a Jew, a false Jew, a Jew in blood, because a, a true Jew would never be a false prophet and sorcerer, whose name was Barjesus, who was with the proconsul, the governor of the, of this, 
island of Cyprus. Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So, um, do we have apostate Jews in our world today? So think about this. God, and people get so upset at Jews and just want to blow them off and say they, you know, they go along with the rest of the world saying just get rid of all the Jews and the world will be better off. Satan has deceived Jews throughout history, even in the history of the prophet Jeremiah. What, what's Jeremiah telling the people? Don't listen to these false prophets that tell you that judgment's not coming because of all the wickedness that our nation has been deceived into doing. That's what we've been studying over and over, chapter after chapter. There, there's, wicked, there's wicked people in every culture. And, and so when there's Jews around, that Satan will use this Jewish sorcerer, false prophet, to get right to the top, be the right-hand guy, to the governor of the island, to make sure the gospel doesn't come, to do Satan's bidding. And it happens today. What, what, what are the, from, a, from a corporate standpoint, what's the greatest false teacher, deceiver organization in the world? In, in the country, let's say. Would Hollywood be right up there? Ho Hollywood is the false teacher, deceiver, sorcerer of the world. And what a lot of the people that are inspired to make all these great entertaining movies and stuff, what, what, what are they? A lot of them are Jews. And, and you see that in the, in the higher echelons, even in the World Economic Forum, the, the greatest voice, prophet, deceiver of the need for global government within the World Economic Forum is a spiritual guru, uh, Yavol Noah Harari, a Jewish homosexual professor at Hebrew University in Israel. And so because of that, a lot of people hate the Jews. But Paul didn't hate the Jews because of this guy. He just realizes they're around. Deceivers are everywhere. False prophets are everywhere. They're inspired by Satan everywhere. And our culture has been deceived. And that's what we have to tell people. And, and when we join in with the deception, with things that are going on, and you know, letting our kids be educated by, by shows of occultism and Satanism and everything else because they do such a nice job and it's just a movie or just this or just that, we're, we're contributing to the demise. And, and the gaming that we do, all the gamings and the stuff that's happening, it's all programming our, our society for destruction. And, we, and Jesus tells us to be, come out of them and be separate. So, um, by the way, who was with the proconsul, and that word proconsul means that he was assigned to the island by the Senate, the Roman Senate. If you're a procurator, you're assigned by Caesar. And people mock the Bible and saying, no, no, look at this history document that shows that Caesar considered Cyprus his responsibility. And so that should have been a procurator. And so Luke got it wrong. He's a false historian. Well, then they found another document that Caesar decided he wanted to, you know, because Caesar and the Senate were fighting for a while. And Caesar says, hey, I got to have control over this area because this is where our military troops are. And, you know, where, where I don't have to deal with the military, then you, you Senate can be, put your guy in charge. Well, Caesar decided he wanted another area more important than Cyprus, so he agreed with the Senate that Senate could decide who goes to, Crete, or to um, Cyprus at the same time. So there again, the perfect accuracy of the historian Luke that discredited um, the so-called higher critics of the Bible. And so this man, an intelligent man, sought to hear the word of God. As we say during Christmas time, wise men still seek him, don't they? And I love the t-shirt that uh, Brian wore, and he got me one. It says, the greatest mistake you'll make is dying without you know, knowing Jesus, to die without Jesus. Wise men, you know, people make mistakes. Foolish people make really big mistakes. But wise men seek him, and they realize the worst thing I could do is to jeopardize my eternal soul by thinking something's more important than trusting and believing in Jesus and becoming his. Uh, Acts 13.8, but uh, Elimus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, 
withstood them, Paul and Barnabas, we, you know, the, Paul and Barnabas are witnessing to the proconsul, and, and you go, no, no, don't listen to these guys. <laughs> they're, they're deceiving you. That's what he's doing. Withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, first time mentioned Paul, from now on he stays Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, and this is so important because he was probably putting up with it for a while, not knowing what to do. But then God miraculously at this point goes, okay, Paul, I'm going to use you in a special way. Phew. Holy Spirit comes upon him. And then Paul just all of a sudden, it's his words are not really his. They're the Holy Spirit speaking through him. Looked intently at him and said, oh, all full of all deceit and all fraud. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Wow. <laughs> and then he says, and now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Now, so the Holy Spirit said, Paul, you can say this because I'm going to make it happen. I want you to say this, and this is going to be a witness to this proconsul that, that the Holy Spirit beats the magician's sorcerer's magic and, and his deception. In other words, I want this proconsul to know you, Paul, are telling him the truth, and this Jewish guy is telling him a lie. And so that was the miraculous way that he did that. Um, and, and going back to that story of um, you know, <laughs> that friend that was on my 10 most wanted list, uh, I, I don't tell people you're going to get healed. I don't, I don't say that. But I, did, I was like, whoa, what did I just say? But it was the Holy Spirit at that time. It was the Holy Spirit saying, just, just tell them, don't take no for an answer, and tell them. And so well, if I don't take no for an answer, come here, you're going to get healed. And he went. And so we can't just, what happens on TV and a lot of these shows is they, these prophet wannabes and whatever, they just think it's a matter of having faith in your faith, having faith in your words. I can just say it and it's going to happen. Do, do you think Paul ran, ever ran into anybody that opposed him in the gospel again? Um, yeah, lots of times. Do you think in his flesh he would have realized, can I tell them that they're going to go blind if they keep bothering me? He, he might have thought that because I, that's what happened on Cyprus and he didn't get led because he didn't ever do it again. So we have to realize that the Holy Spirit truly, when you beg God, God, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Go into talking with somebody. I need you to communicate to me. I need your power. You want me to have the, your power to be a witness in this world. And then he might just have you do something that you would not have normally done or even know how to communicate. Called, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently to him full of deceit. Um, so what are those that oppose the gospel? What are they? Sons of the devil. Enemies of righteousness. Full of fraud. Deceit. Uh, he might have even been using magic deceptions with this proconsul, and all that was made null and void when uh, Paul rebuked him and he went blind. And now indeed, the hand is upon you. Divine judgment. And verse 12 Acts 13, 12, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Did he get saved because Paul's magic was better than his, better than the sorcerer's magic? No, it was the message because he wanted to hear the message and Paul gave him the message. And so what, what happened is God used the miracle to validate the messenger, but it's the message that saves the gospel. And verse 13, Acts 13, 13, now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga, which is a city in Pamphylia, a state in Turkey today, southern Turkey. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So, you know, we don't know why. The Bible doesn't say, but Paul got pretty upset about it because the next time they go on a missionary journey, Barnabas wants to bring John Mark again, and Paul goes, no way. That, you know, that guy bailed on us. And, and God used that division because 
Barnabas and Mark went one way and Paul went another way. And so there was more of a mission <laughs> that was accomplished through that. So whatever, whatever it was, it bothered Paul that, that uh, he had to carry his own luggage from then on or something, I don't know. And uh, verse 14, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. This is not Antioch of Syria. This is Antioch of what's today Turkey. And he's again going to the synagogue. Verse 15, and after the reading of the law and the prophets, you go into synagogue and they read the word of God. They read the law, Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, teaching the Jews the word of God. The rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Oh, you guys are Jews? You're out of towners? Do you have some exhortation for us? Then Paul stood up. You know, <laughs> Paul said, no, actually, we don't have anything to say. <laughs> Then Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel, Jews, in the audience of the synagogue, and you who fear God, who's that? The Gentiles who are wanting to be Jews, they're going to the synagogue to learn about the God of Israel. Listen, verse 17, 13, 17, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. What, where is that recorded in the Bible? Book of Exodus. So he's starting the history of the Jews at the time the Jews are in slavery in Egypt. Verse 18, now for a time of about 40 years, he put up, he put up <laughs> with their ways in the wilderness. He, what he's going to emphasize to these Jews in the synagogue is, you know what? Our history is full of a bunch of unbelief towards the true God. And I know when I get to the punchline that you need to believe in Jesus, who's the prophesied Messiah, you're gonna, a lot of you are going to just reject me. You're going to reject the message. So he's pointing out the times that Israel lived in unbelief because he put up with them for 40 years because they had refused by faith to go into the promised land. And so the adults had to die off. And if you don't know your Bible, I'm going to be losing you for the next several verses here because we're not going to go back and do all this. So book of Exodus... Exodus through Deuteronomy. For the time of 40 years, read Exodus through Deuteronomy. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, which is now Israel, the land of Israel, he distributed their land to them by allotment. That's in the book of Joshua. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. That's the book of Judges and parts of uh, book of 1 Samuel. You know, verse 19 was the book of Joshua. This is now the book of Judges. So he's rapidly going through the Bible, but they're all familiar with this. And afterwards, they asked for a king. So God gave the, them Saul, the son of Kish, the first king of Israel, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And that's recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 22. And when he had removed him, when God had removed him because of Saul's unbelief and rebellion against God, he raised up for them their second king, David, as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. That's in First and Second Samuel. So we're, we're going through the Old Testament here pretty quickly. If you don't know it, you should read it. <laughs> From this man's seed, from David's seed, according to the promise, because David was promised by God that David, you're going to have a descendant and he will be the Messiah. So God promised the Messiah to Abraham, then to Isaac, then to Jacob, then he promised it to Judah, the tribe of Judah, then he promised it to David within the tribe of Judah, your descendant is going to be the Messiah. And so, according to that promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus, as promised by dozens of Old Testament prophecies, which, by the way, and Chuck Smith dealt with this in our Through the Bible with Chuck Smith in our school of ministry. The thing is, is that there were so many prophecies about the coming Messiah, when he would be born, where he would be born, what was going to happen to him, how he would be killed, how he would raise from the grave all these other things that were prophesied, if Jesus is not the Messiah, 
then dozens of prophecies in the Old Testament are all lies, and, we sh and therefore we should be throwing away our Bible, which is built on all of this. So there cannot be another... See, this is what's so crazy for the Jews. The, the Jews, the Bible says today, are going to be receiving the Antichrist as their Messiah. They are going to be... Jesus says, I have come in my Father's name, me you have rejected, another will come in his own name, him you will accept. They're going to receive the, Messiah, the Antichrist as their Messiah because he's going to let them build their temple and he's going to give them peace from, the, you know, from any more of the coming wars that are coming. You know, they're going to experience the coming wars and then the global government ruled by the Antichrist is going to say, we're going to do all this to make it so you never have enemies that attack you again. They go, oh, you're our Messiah. But they have to ignore the dozens of prophecies that will have nothing to do with the coming of that Antichrist. They, they, there cannot be a Messiah. And I've even talked to Jews about that. If, if Jesus wasn't the Messiah, you can never have a Messiah. After John, Jesus, after John, meaning the Baptist, verse 24 of Acts 13, had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people. Is Paul making it clear that the gospel requires that before you get to Jesus, you repent? Uh, God sent John the Baptist to get repentance first, but that doesn't save you. What, you know, doesn't it doesn't save you to say, oh, I'm not going to smoke or drink or chew anymore. I, I'm going to repent of what I'm doing in my life. Uh, that doesn't save you. You have to agree that you want to repent of rebelling against God and live according to you want his law to rule you, but then you have to trust Jesus as your Savior. And as John was finishing his course, he said, course of his ministry, he said, who do, you, who do you think I am? And they were actually asking him, you know, are you the Messiah? No. Are you the prophet? No. But he's saying, who do you think I am? I am not he. I am not the promised Messiah, nor am I that prophet of Deuteronomy 18. But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. So they were in, John, the, the ministry of John the Baptist had spread through the world. People knew about John the Baptist. And so he's telling these Jews in the synagogue who would have known about John the Baptist, he was not the Messiah. He was not the promised prophet of Deuteronomy 18. He said that there was somebody greater than him, much greater than him, because he was the first prophet to Israel in over 400 years. He was an esteemed man. He was nothing compared to the Jesus he preached about. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, proselytizing Gentiles, to you, the word of this salvation has been sent. God has sent me here, and now I'm telling you what it takes to be saved. Why? Because Paul was available, willing, and empowered by the Spirit. He had shown up at, the, at Jesus' um, you know, house, or, you know, at his uh, labor union, saying, I'm, I'm available, I'm ready, and the Holy Spirit's told me to go, and I'm going to go, even though I don't even know what's going to happen. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets. They, they, don't, they didn't even care that Jesus was fulfilling all these prophecies, which, they, which are read every Sabbath. They would read the Bible, but they rejected its truth, have ful fulfilled them, but Jesus has fulfilled those prophecies, fulfilled them, in condemning him, that when they condemned him, they actually fulfilled the prophecies. In Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, etc. Now, why could they not see? Why could the scribes and Pharisees not? I mean, they're reading the Bible. Why could they not see it? Because, probably, as I've emphasized so often, the Bible says, Jesus said, Matthew 11, 25, at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, so it seemed good in your sight. People that stay arrogant against God think that there's somebody. I'm a high priest. I'm, a, I'm one of the elite in Israel. I'm part of the Sanhedrin, and I am a respected by people. They're blind. They can't see it even if it beats them in the face. And that's why your friends and your neighbors and fa family that don't receive Jesus is because they, they cannot see because they're prideful in the rejection of God and needing a Savior. 
Verse 27, Sabbath have filled them and fulfilled these prophecies in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And this is whenever Paul would then preach the resurrection dead is when people would just go, whoa. He, also, he was seen, and he raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. So Jesus wasn't even, didn't allow himself to be seen, apparently, by unbelievers. He, he only reveals himself to people that are humble and, and believe. And uh, the emphasis there is it was the ones that were following him. Verse 32, and he declared to you glad tidings that that promise which was made to the fathers, there's going to be a Messiah, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son today, you are my son today, I have begotten you. Now he's saying that that's prophesying him being raised up. Well, how does it do that? Well, if you go to Psalm 2, 7, it says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son today, I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations of your inheritance to the ends of the earth for your possession. Now, if Jesus stays dead, can he do that? See, really, in a sense, Psalm 2 is a prophecy of the resurrection. Because Jesus is the Son of God, and God has said, this, You are my Son. You are the Son of God, and I'm going to give you the nations. Well, Jesus didn't get the nations when he died. He was told by Satan, Satan, you know, said, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you the nations of the world. And Jesus says, no, man, you know, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you worship. And, and I, my, the Father and I have another plan. We're to beat you and then take over the nations. Uh, and then he goes on to say, you shall break them with a the riot iron. Jesus didn't do that, but he's going to really soon. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. World Economic Forum, Bilderberger Group, you know, globalist mindset. You better be instructed. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. Bow and worship him as your Savior. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in him. I hope that's everybody here. Blessed by God by a prophecy that could not have been fulfilled if Jesus stays in the grave. The resurrection is prophesied here. And then we'll close by going to um, Acts 13, 34 to 41 quickly. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Where the mercy of God is upon us because of the son of David, Jesus. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. So he's prophe another prophecy. The Holy One's not going to corrupt in the grave because he's going to raise from the grave a prophecy of the resurrection. For David, after he had served his generation by the will of God, fell asleep was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. David wasn't talking about himself in Psalm 16. He was talking about the Messiah because he died and rotted in the grave. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you, and just really underline this because it's preached to us too, the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that awesome? You, you, either, go, you either go into eternity with your rap sheet still tied to your to your shirt, or, or you go with the rap sheet gone because you've been forgiven. And by him, everyone who believes is justified, which means just as if I had never done a sin against God. For all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And then verse 40, beware therefore 
lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. What, what does the prophet say comes upon you if you reject Jesus? Everlasting judgment and damnation. Be, beware, behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you, and that's Habakkuk 1.5. You believe in Jesus and get forgiveness or you get the judgment and the wrath of God because you rejected a Savior. And Deuteronomy 18 uh, is the summary verse that really wraps it up because John the Baptist was asked, are you that prophet? And that was the prophecy of Moses in Deuteronomy 18 is that God will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. He'll be a Jew. Jesus was a Jew and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words through Jesus, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. And here we are on the verge of the last days. I mean, we are on the verge of the last of the last days. And the prophets have spoken and they've said, you've got to believe in Jesus. Or you're going to die and spend eternity in the lake of fire. And, and so Paul went through all the rejection that had happened in their history. And now he's going into the synagogue and he says, the, the, Messiah, the promised Messiah is here. It's Jesus. He rose from the grave. You must believe in him. You must shift from justification by the laws of Moses, which never saved anybody. And you must go to justification by faith in Jesus. We, you know, we have to ignore all religion and have a relationship with God. Is there anybody here that has not yet bowed the knee to Jesus to have a relationship with God that we could pray with you right now as we close? Anybody? Just felt that there's no, there's no more important thing, especially as we see things ramping up. If you have never bowed your knee to Jesus and said, God, save me a sinner, and you can just acknowledge in front of you, I haven't done it, I want to tell everybody here, I'm putting down my weapons of warfare against God, I'm repenting, I want Jesus to be my Savior. Anybody? All right. So, um, let's pray, and, uh, and just thank God for what he's done to save us. Father, we, we rejoice, Lord, in, in your word, and just all that you did, God, to save us from sin, to make it so that we could have everlasting life and, and to just help us to stop from trying to create a righteousness of our own through works that we could never do because we, we are so bent on rebellion and sin against you and all authority. And we, we pray that God in these last days you would help us to be available, willing. Help us to be set free from the distractions that keep us from that special time that we can have with you where your Holy Spirit can direct our paths and, and we can just be available to you, Lord, to, um, to just minister the truth to those that are still lost. And Father, we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy God. Your name in all the